Hi everyone, welcome. We'll get going in just a few moments. Just gonna try to get my social media set up over here. I'm talking three different places. We'll get going in just a few moments. I need to share a screen this morning, Jessica. Could you just tell me if you can see this? Boom. Boom. Second. One second over here. Let's try doing this. No, that's not the right one. I'll try that again. Yeah, can you see me and hear me? Great. Give me one second, peoples. We're just gonna get going over here in a second, and we're gonna go here, and boom. Like that. Okay, can you see my screen, Jessica? Great. Okay. Let's get going. Welcome. Good morning, everyone, on Facebook and on Instagram. Uh, and of course, our friends who are Zooming in as well. Welcome, Bukhim Habaim. Today, we're going to be tackling a subject. And I'm going to use the word tackling because this is not an easy subject to talk about in a number of ways. But as the title of this course always teaches us, if you want to become a better version of yourself, this is something you're going to have to work at continually. And this is something that I'm always working on. And it's going to be destructive speech. And how to avoid it. How we can avoid destructive speech. Now, I need to take you back. Those who are not with us and those even who were with us last week. Last week, we spoke about positive speech. And we spoke a little bit, just to recap, because we're going to connect this in just a couple of ways. We spoke about, my dear friends, how positive speech has the power to build the world. God used speech, debor, to create the world, to create the universe, to create humans, to create the neshama of people. So we know from the get-go that if you want to build something, speech is going to be a big part of it. And that was last week's topic. You can find that on Facebook and Instagram and Zoom if you want to recap. This week, however, we're going to have to flip the coin and look at the other side because we're going to learn, as we say in Hebrew, a kal v'chomer. If speech has the ability and the power to build up a person, if speech has the ability to create worlds, there hasn't been a successful relationship in world history that did not stem from good and healthy communication, which we said last week is unique among humans, that it comes through this koach hadibor, the power of speech. If that's true, there has never been a war. There has never been a broken relationship, whether a work or personal or marriage that did not come some way from destructive speech and lack of healthy communication. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. The power and destructive force of negative speech. And there's a lot written on this topic. The Gemara tells us that the first temple was destroyed by the Babylonians because the Jewish people were suffering from three diseases. Disease number one, Avodah Zarah. They were involved in idol worship. They were outside of their real connection to God and to each other and involved in Avodah Zarah. Number two, there was forbidden relationships among the Jewish people. Illicit relationships, number two. And three, there was Shvichut Damim. There was murder. There was murder among our people. Whether that murder was literal murder or we'll speak about it in the future, whether it was embarrassing each other, not speaking well to each other, 
This was all the Ritzicha, the murder that existed at the time of the destruction of the first temple. We're going to jump hundreds of years. Because then the Gemara asks very famously, how about the second temple? How about the second temple? Why was the second temple destroyed when the Romans came? And Titus, the Roman general, destroyed the temple and exiled the Jewish people for what's been millennia. And the Gemara says we also have to look at ourselves and find blame in ourselves. And the reason was, Lashon Hara. We were not speaking well to each other. So we see two temples seemingly destroyed for very different reasons. And the Gemara finishes, and the commentators talk about this so much, my friends. You can learn from this, that the two are equal. We Jews, I wanted to get a feeling for this because we've lost our spiritual sensitivity. I'm talking about myself, to this destructive speech that we just throw out there and we write and we hint and we talk about each other. But they say that negative speech has the same destructive power in a relationship than Avodah Zarah idol worship, Shvichot Damim, murder and Gileorite, forbidden sexual relationships, and sexual immorality, idolatry and murder. The two are connected. Every time we don't check what we say and how we say it. And today we're going to look at five different forms of destructive speech. And hopefully by identifying them, by identifying them, we'll be able to hopefully, God willing, steer, steer away a little bit. Now, people think, you know, this destructive speech thing, as we say in Hebrew, Lashon Hara, is limited to bad people, right? That person is a Rasha, that person is an evil person, and therefore they speak bad. But this is not true. This is a big mistake. Everybody is involved in this. No matter how religious and spiritual you are. And the Torah itself goes out of the way to describe a story about one of the greatest women in Jewish history. Actually, were not for this woman, we the Jewish people wouldn't be who we are today. We wouldn't have left Egypt. We wouldn't have received the Torah. We would be nothing without this woman. And her name was Miriam, Moshe Rabbeinu's older sister. She was a prophetess. She was a visionary. We could give a whole lecture just on this incredible individual. And this great woman, Miriam, however, even she, and the Torah goes out of its way, it's actually a mitzvah. It's going to sound weird, this, to remember this one incident that happened in her life and to keep it before our eyes all the time. And Miriam, we know, she spoke Lashon Hara about her younger brother. About a younger brother. He was involved in a relationship with a woman. She felt that he had made a mistake. She was wrong. But she felt that he made a mistake with the way he treated her. They separated for a period of time after many years in old age. And she spoke about it. And by the way, Miriam loved Moshe Rabbeinu. She saved his life. She was the one who put her own life in danger by making sure that he was born, by making sure he was safe in the bulrushes, by following up with him, by being involved in his upbringing. So her love for him held no bounds. She adored her baby brother Moshe Rabbeinu. And yet, even the great Miriam says the Torah, at great length, even she made the fatal mistake of speaking Lashon Hara about her baby brother. For this, she received what's called Sarat, which is a leprosy-like affliction, and she had to leave the camp for a number of days before she was allowed to get back into the camp. And Moshe Rabbeinu prayed for her. It's actually the prayer itself is the shortest tefillah in the entire Torah, the shortest prayer in the entire Torah, and she was let back in. So we talk about destructive speech. We're not talking about bad people. We're talking about great people. We're talking about holy people. We're talking about me and you and your friends and your family. We're all involved in this disease. And by the way, this is not, my friends, limited just to people. We know that the reason the Jewish people were not let into the land of Israel at the right time, whatever the right time was, was because there were spies that were sent into Israel who had to scout out the land. And what was meant to happen was they would walk in 
under the leadership of Moshe Rabbeinu, to see the land of Israel and to say, wow, this is a great country. I love this country. I cannot wait to go in. And yet they came back and they gave a negative report. Ten out of the 12 spies gave a negative uh, report about the land and they spoke Lashon Hara about the land. People are confused. Why is that considered bad? They came back. They gave a report. Because once, this is very important, especially in today's day and age, when you speak bad about people or places or things, and what I mean by speaking bad is that now other people are going to have a distorted relationship with that person by uh, hurting them physically, emotionally, spiritually, psychologically. No one's going to treat them the same. Or you speak bad about a business for no constructive reason. What do you think of that place? Ugh, don't bother going there. Waste your money. We just throw those words out. What do you think about this product? I'll give you my review. Everyone's got an opinion. Everyone's got a review, everything. And now that product or that restaurant or that wine or whatever it is, ends up being unappreciated. And the people, and there are people behind this, are now hurt. And their, far, their parnasa, their, their income, is negatively impacted by your loose words, you're bringing destruction upon this person physically, emotionally, financially, even upon this thing, even upon the land of Israel. These spies spoke bad about Israel. The majority of the Jewish people believed them. They didn't want to go in. Lashon Hara, that entire generation, lost their entitlement to move into Israel. You don't appreciate the gift. You speak bad about it. That's it, chalas. You don't get it. And that, my friends, is the disease of Lashon Hara. By the way, I'll just tell you, I'm going to talk about Israel for just a moment because we've entered this world where everyone can express their opinions about everything on social media, online, and WhatsApp chats and groups. We have to check this. When we talk about negative speech, we don't just mean actual speech. It could be the written word. It could be even rolling your eyes when someone does something and everyone sees it. These These forms of criticism, of destructive output that we're so quick to spread can have a terrible, you know, the Gemara tells us something quite beautiful. It says there were great rabbis. Just hear these words from me. It's worth just who used to travel, used to travel around Israel, picking up the garbage. We're talking the times of the Talmud. Why? Why? So that visitors who would enter into Israel wouldn't say, ugh, it's so dirty in here. What a ugly and dirty country. So in order to prevent that, great Jewish leaders would pick up the garbage. There were great rabbis who would give shirim classes, and they would mostly do them outdoors in Israel. It's beautiful. But they would make sure to do it in the shade so that a person would not sit there and say, ugh, it's so hot. It's just too hot here. I don't want to be here. You speaking bad about the land of Israel? Not a good thing. That is the, it's a high standard, I understand. But that is the level of protection that we are meant to have about a place. We learn from this what's called in Hebrew, a kalvachomer. If we have to be careful about stones and rocks of God's chosen land, the land of Israel, how much more so, how much more so how we speak to and about each other. So that's the story of Miriam, a great woman who herself spoke Lashon Hara, and the Torah goes out of its way to not only describe her great virtues, but her mistakes. By the way, the Torah never, and Jewish history never shies away from criticizing great people. Actually, what makes them great for us, the Jewish people, is that they are human and make mistakes. As a side point, one of the reasons, there's many reasons, But one of the reasons the Jewish people did not accept Jesus at the time, a little bit too perfect. And many years after he died, when they tried to create a whole new religion, it was all too perfect. Son of God. Only a mother can think their son is the son of God. But no one else should and no one else can. It was all too perfect for us, the Jewish people. We don't put too much faith in people because people let us down. No one is perfect and no one is without mistake, especially in this area. So we're not, 
what I'm going to describe to you today is not looking for perfection. There is no perfection in this topic. There is, however, room for improvement when it comes to speech. Okay, so let's jump, if we can, because I want to get to the nitty gritty of five categories of negative speech, how we Jews define them, how Judaism and the Jewish sources define these five areas of speech. Now, I will mention that these five areas of speech are related to another five. It's chamsa and chamsa. Whenever numbers appear in different areas, although they different areas completely, usually they are related. So we're going to look at five categories of destructive and negative speech. What constitutes uh, negative speech in each one of these areas? But I'm going to connect them to the five levels of the human soul. Yes, I know you're shocked. You thought you had one soul? No, my friends. You actually have five souls, five levels of your soul. And each one of them has a different function. Each one has a different purpose. Each one of them adds something else to you and your unique personality. These five match these five. The five levels of the soul are the nefesh. That's the lowest level. That is the animal spirit. That's the level of the soul we share with behemoths, with animals. And that is the desire to do physical things, to eat, to sleep, to drink, to have physical relationships. Above that is the ruach. That is the spirit that is inside each and every one of us. That actually is located. The nefesh is in the blood. The ruach is in the heart. Okay, and that's also where speech comes from as well, as we mentioned last class. After that comes the neshama, located in the brain. And that is the intellectual side. The side that wants to improve yourself, wants to improve the world and do good things. And there's a battle between these different five levels. The other two are somewhere in heaven. We're not sure exactly in the spiritual realm. The chaya and yechida. So but the three we mentioned are connected to these two. And that's really how we see things. So each time we speak negatively about other people, we're actually, whatever this means, are actually destroying the five levels of our soul. So these five match these five. Five levels of the soul, five areas of negative speech, and every time we speak bad and negatively, which we're going to define for you, I'm going to give you an exact and clear description of what we mean by that, somehow that's going to break down not just the person you're speaking about, but yourself as well. You know, when you speak negatively about somebody else, to other people, although we're going to include in this list speaking negatively to a person directly to them, but we'll leave that aside. That may not weirdly be the worst uh, area. Um, but negative speech to others about other people <clears throat> involves three people. The speaker, the medaber, as we say, the shomea, the listener, and Misha Midaber, I love the person we're speaking about. We'll say that again. Every time negative speech happens, there's three parties involved. The speaker, the listener, and the one being spoken about. Each one of those three are being negatively impacted. The Rambam says, very interestingly, of these three, one of them is the worst. Of these three, one of them is really doing a terrible, terrible thing. Who would you think? of the speaker, the listener, and the one being spoken about is the worst of the three. Who's really messing up over here? Now, I would have thought the speaker, the one who's got negativity, negativity and hatred in their heart and can't wait to share that. We all know such people. We're going to talk about how to deal with those people today, I promise you. But those people who are just constantly talking, they're negative people, always saying bad things. I would have thought they're the worst of the three. Because had they kept their mouths shut, we wouldn't be in the situation we're in. If they would have kept their negative speech inside their heads, or in their cases, inside their hearts, this problem would never have come out. The answer is, however, it's not the speaker of the three, it's the listener. The listener is judged worse than the other three. Why is that? Why is the listener judged worse of the three? And the answer is, because if there isn't a person in listening to your negative speech, if there wasn't a person 
who was there to talk about other, about other people and the person to listen to accept it, the information would never spread. It would stay stuck inside that negative person's mind or heart. So the person who listens, as we say in Hebrew, the Makabel Lashon Hara, the person who accepts it, that person is the worst. Because without them, it wouldn't have got out and been spread to other people. So we're going to speak about the speaker, but we're also going to speak about the listener. Because you may be a perfect person, and you may be a wonderful person, who would never dream of speaking Lashon Hara, I've yet to meet such a person. But that may be who you are listening today. However, everyone is in danger of hearing negative speech, and then they're in double danger of letting it out. And let's be honest, talking gossip, as we say in the modern vernacular, talking smack about other people is enjoyable. There's a reason it's called juicy gossip. It's juicy. There's something about it. And we have to try to figure out why. We've got to dig beneath the surface. Why is it that we have this enjoyment of speaking bad about other people or hearing bad things about other people and then having that information be spread, spread out there into the world, just throwing it out to the universe without thinking twice about it. We're going to have to figure that out. Okay, let's start with our five levels and types of negative speech. Number one is what we call in Hebrew, ruchilut, which is really, for all intents and purposes, it's called gossip. And that is uh, really what the Torah speaks about when it says, do not go as a gossip monger among your people. And the word for this is ruchilut, which is related to the word regel. Ruchil and regel are connected through the sounding of the letters. And regel means foot. These are the people who just go out and just like talk about, oh, do you know what that person's doing? Oh, do you know what they're up to? You know those people we have this like, you know, the yachna, as we say. The person who likes the fazul. The person who likes to just go out and just keep talking, 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 chatting, chatting, chatting. Like two birds, says the Gemara, just tweeting away. Nowadays, it's literal, right? Tweeting away about each other and letting the information just go out. This person is considered a person that brings great damage to themselves, to the listener, and all of society. Do you know what? Do you know what they said about you? Do you know what's going on? Do you know what so-and-so did? These constant forms of speech and gossip that we are always spreading is like a peddler says the Gemara, that of a person who's out there, just negative speech, their negativity, which we said is worse when it comes to speech and writing, we consider the same, by the way. We're making no difference between the written word and the spoken word over here. Writing is just another way of communicating, potentially negative and it's also positive, but negative and destructive speech. So that is number one. That is a person who just likes to go and gossip, and that, say the commentators, brings hatred between people and therefore causes them to transgress another prohibition in the Torah, which is, don't hate other people in your heart. Because the root of this, it may not be so obvious to most people, but this comes from people who hold hatred in their heart. Now, they'll come with many, many, many forms of excuses. But people who are constantly gossiping about other people, they have a hatred that they are carrying with them all the time. Okay? By the way, I'll give you one of the cures over here. And you may not like to hear this. But if you know such people, and we all know such people who are constantly negative in their speech, constantly gossiping, one of the things you're actually meant to do is stay away from them. Now, many people think, no, but I can help them, I can change them, I can improve them. And the answer is, you probably can't. Because if they don't want to change, they won't. They need to be ready for change. Our job, our job is to take care of ourselves, protect ourselves. And if we distance ourselves from these individuals, there is less chance that the information we're receiving is going to be spread. That is the honest truth. Okay, number two. Number two is harmful or derogatory speech. Now we call this Lashon Hara. 
Lashon hara. The exact translation of these words is, Lashon is speech, hara, that is going to bring badness to the world. And this is actually considered the worst form of communication, of derogatory negative speech. And that is, Rechilut is speech that is not necessarily negative, but causes disputes and hatred between people, from people. Lashon hara. Now this is a very important distinction that the rabbis go out of their way to repeat many times. And it may again seem counterintuitive. Lashon hara. Destructive speech in order to be considered Lashon hara must be true. Now here we're going to make a departure from how general societies define negative speech. Because libel that many people confuse this idea with, is only a problem if it's false. We, if you prove it's true, it's not libel. That's not the way it works in Judaism. In Judaism, we say that something can be true. It can be true. And yet when we talk about it and we spread this true information, it is still destructive. It can impact this person negatively, financially, psychologically, and remember in Judaism, we consider spiritual and a mental harm to be as bad or worse than physical harm. As I mentioned last class, we always said as children, sticks and stones break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Terrible thing to t- teach children. Terrible. You've got to stop that. Sticks and stones can break bones, but they can be healed. But bad speech and negative words can destroy a person's essence forever. I just came off a call with an, uh, with an individual. I've actually had uh, six calls this morning. And one of them was someone who has been struggling in relationships for many, many years. And this uh, young lady told me that it all stemmed from the lack of positive reinforcement she received as a young child and she's much older now but all of the challenges that she's been dealing with in relationships stems from not having good role models and her family growing up constantly talking negatively to her and about her and about other people all the time it stays with you forever she had a broken bone as a kid I'm sure that healed very, very nicely. And she doesn't even feel anymore. So we're not talking about small things here. Mental harm in Judaism is its own talk. And negative speech stays with a person forever. That is the concept of Lashon Hara. Harm causing speech. That, by spreading, even though it's true, it's true. Do you know what she did? And you tell someone about a third party. And you do it because there's no constructive purpose for doing it. If it, there's a real constructive purpose, it's permitted. If someone, for example, actually one of the calls I had this morning was a guy who was dating a girl. And he called me up and he said, could you find any information about her? The information which I've started to gather on this young woman, not all of it is positive. But I need to tell him because... He's going to spend the rest of his life with this woman. That's considered constructive. It may be negative on the surface, but there's a constructive. In Hebrew, we call it a to'elet. That is understood. That is accepted. We're trying to protect a person. If I know, for example, you're about to go into business and you say, Rabbi, what do you think about this deal? I found this guy called Madoff. I'm like, well, I don't want to talk negatively about him. And therefore, I have nothing to say. And the answer is no. You say, don't invest money with that guy. I know what he's doing. There's a common sense that goes with this, um, this departure, this topic, obviously. But it must be honestly a real constructive purpose that goes with it. Okay, so that's number two. Number two is true information that is destructive, that has no constructive element, no toilet, no purpose. You just say it because you want to say it. And there's nothing good that's going to come out of your talking to another person. So we have general negative gossip. That is most likely false. We have negative gossip or negative speech. That is true. That is Lashon Hara. And those are the two main areas. 
Now the remaining three are less obvious and yet they are as serious. Number three is what we call motzi shem ra, to bring out derogatory speech or words that are untrue. What we would call, I guess in English, defamation. Talking falsehood, lies about people, is great, I don't know, I use the exact words, is judged very harshly in heaven. Now, I want to talk about what I mean by that. We've mentioned in the past, during this series, of a concept called Mida Keneged Mida, measure for measure. This is a Jewish concept that goes right through all areas of Jewish thought and Jewish philosophy. And this idea works very, very strongly when it comes to how we speak about other people. How we speak about other people. Let me be very, very clear with this. When you talk negatively about other people, there is a judgment that is being made. And that judgment isn't just on that person, it's also on you. As someone says, when you point at someone else, one finger pointing at the other person, three fingers are pointing at yourself. The way you judge other people is how God judges you. The way you speak about other people is how God allows the spiritual world to speak about you as well. Meaning, when you speak bad about other people, you're actually judging yourself negatively as well. Because God says, you know what? Just like a parent and child, a parent does not like it when someone speaks badly about their kids. God does not like it when we speak bad about each other because we are all God's children. The problem is, that God will allow, as it were, the angels or the prosecutors in heaven to talk bad about us if we open our mouths about other people. That is the measure for measure that is being manifested in this realm of Lashon Hara, of negative speech. And therefore, when we talk lies about each other, when we say bad things about, about each other, which are bad now, truthfully, Telling lies about other people may not be as bad as Lashon Hara, which is telling truth, which is negative. But lying, because eventually lies are found out. How long can a lie last? Eventually it comes out and people are going to know, in most cases, eventually they're going to know that it's not true. Not always, but most cases. However, when it comes to negative lies about other people, we are still destroying a person's reputation. And in the end, in the end, the most important thing that we have in this world is our reputations. The trust that we are able to give out to the world. It takes, as I point out to people all the time, it takes a long time to build trust in a relationship. But that trust is a weird thing because it can be broken in a moment and take a long time to rebuild. And therefore, this form of Lashon Ara, which comes in the form of lying and destructive speech from untrue things, can have a terrible negative effect upon people. Okay, so that's number three. So, so far we did general gossip, which is true or untrue. Next, we have Lashon Ara, which by definition is true negative speech about other people. Then Moti Shemra, just talking complete nonsense about other people, but it's still destructive because it's lying. Then we come to something which most people are not aware is a form of Lashon Ara. And yet, in many ways, I consider this to be the worst. And this is something which I myself have to be very, very careful with. And that is saying things to other people, what we call onat devarim, that causes them great pain. Now included in this, says Maimonides, is just talking bad to people. You're so dumb, you're so stu hey shorty, right? Using nicknames or insulting people or embarrassing them or even saying to them in private. Anytime we use the power of speech to hurt another person directly, not through a third party, but directly to that person, or to that person in front of other people, embarrassing them in Judaism, embarrassing a person 
is as bad, if not worse, than killing them, than spilling blood. Now, a person is not held accountable for embarrassing someone as they were for shooting them. I don't think we uh, consider these two things the same in terms of uh, responsibility. However, the destructive power of embarrassing other people, I think everyone here, everyone who's listening, can think back to their childhood. I know I can. And think back to a time that a, a teacher or a friend said something insulting to us in front of other people and how embarrassed it made us feel. This is something I have to be careful with because I have this tendency, you may have noticed, to be very into jokes. And the humor I grew up with was always what we would call roasting other people. In America, we don't call it that in England where I grew up, but roasting other people and embarrassing them. And it's enjoyable, you know, and zinging them with your comments and embarrassing them. And many times they'll take it with a smile on their face, but inside you've crushed them and you've embarrassed them. And joking at other people's expense is considered a form of Lashon Hara. And this is something that I need to work on because, you know, I, I enjoy that. I'll be honest with you. It's, it's enjoyable to make jokes about other people and laugh at them. Now, if they really don't mind, for example, they have a nickname, right, which they don't mind you using or an abbreviation of their name, and you're clear about that, and you can use that. You know, I grew up, my name was Hajioff, and they used to call me Hajj or Hedgehog, right? And that was just my nickname, you know? Well, so that's part of who we are, and that seems to be acceptable. But sometimes we use nicknames, or we say things to people in front of other people that embarrasses them greatly, and that form of negative, destructive speech is terrible, you know? Even things like, that's a really dumb question. I, you know, I, I look back at my childhood in school. I, I lived on a gen different generation. And the teacher was very quick to say, oh, you're so stupid. How could you ask such a stupid question? I'm very careful. I try to be careful, no matter how stupid the question is, or how stupid the answer is. Never, especially in a public class setting, where I will say, that's a really dumb question. What kind of answer is that? I mean, you, can, you can crush a person. That, that feeling that person feels at that moment can re remain with them for months and years. The Torah judges such comments terribly. I'm just telling you, don't shoot the messenger. It considers such expressions terrible. Okay? Okay. Finally, is something which... The Rambam tells us we all do all the time. And to be fair, it's not the worst type of Lashon Hara, this fifth type. However, it's something we have to at least be aware of. And it's called Avak Lashon Hara, which means the dust or the surface. And what it involves is, I don't know how best to describe it, but there needs to be a sensitivity in even what we say to people because it could be misunderstood. This is basically negative speech which could be misunderstood. And it's called Avak Lashon And I'll give you an example of it. If I were to say to you, oh, that woman, I don't know, Sheila, if there's a Sheila listening today, I'm not talking about you. Sheila, wow, her fridge is always full. There's always food in her table. Is that a negative speech? Or is that a positive speech? Well, it depends. The listener is left to decide whether that's positive. It could be, what a generous person. There's always food to serve guests and family and celebrate Shabbat and Jewish holidays. Or it is, wow, she needs to eat less because there's so much food in her fridge. She needs to take it easy. The intentions of the speaker is not clear. It's left to the listener to interpret up to... The, you're expected. Now, again, this is a little bit far-fetched, a little remote. However, this is the expectation. We should try at least to be aware, no matter what I tell you, you're going to keep doing this all the time. But at least be aware and sensitive that even if something could be misunderstood, we're expected to be careful about it. The Gemara gives the example that if you know someone has someone in the family who was hanged for an offense, which was something which used to happen a lot in the olden days, you shouldn't say to them, oh, could you hang this meat? 
Now, you may mean nothing by that expression, hang this meat, but this person will be like, wow, hanging meat sounds familiar. It takes me back to, and therefore it's a, an extra, an extra sensitivity. And a person is not judged as harshly for insulting a person, for cursing a person out, for shouting at them, getting angry at them, for talking lashonara, gossip or negative speech about them. But there is this extra special sensitivity that needs to go through. You know, I want to tell you about someone I met. I'm even going to talk about this rabbi who lived to a very old age. His name was Rabbi Kleinman, and he lived in the city. He was a rabbi of a synagogue for years and years and years. And um, he lived to a very ripe old age. Rabbi of a synagogue for 60 years. It's on 29th Street and, and Lexington Avenue. Now my friend Rabbi Shlush is the rabbi over there. And I went to this rabbi who reached nearly 100 years old. And I said to him, wow, you've had such a long and rich life. You got to see children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. What was the secret to your longevity? I asked him this question. You know what he said to me? I'll just share what he said. I don't know if he meant it, but I think he did. And he said, I'll tell you why I think I merited. And this is a very deep statement. I want you to really... Take these words with you, because I've taken these words with me as well. Because he didn't have to say this to me. He said, whenever I spoke to someone or about someone, I always took a few seconds to think before I spoke. Can you imagine that? I think he meant it. I think, I, I think he meant it. And by the way, he was a very verbose individual. He would always talk and joke and his jokes were fantastic and his speeches. And he wasn't a quiet individual. But he said, I think I merited a long and healthy life because I always took just a couple of seconds before I spoke to someone and before I spoke about someone. Now, I've thought about his words a lot over the years. And this is definitely an area I need because I'm one of these people who shoots from the lip. You know, it comes in. I, I suffer from what I call HMD, head mouth disease. It's in here. Woo, straight out. HMD. But I thought about his words a lot. They're kind of, as you could tell, they kind of stuck, stuck with me. And I thought about it on two levels. Maybe on a spiritual way, he was judged well by God because he just thought about what he was going to say. He didn't say he never spoke Lashon Hara. He just said he always spoke, thought before he spoke. How much pain, how much disaster and destructive occurrences I'm sure were avoided by him just checking himself for a moment before he let these words come out of his mouth. But I think also there's a, a mental health issue here that he was just able to not let everything just blurt out and then deal with all of the consequences. Because let's think about it, when it comes to relationships, we just kind of fight and argue and shout and talk about other people and just put it out there. And then it's just kind of left hanging. And once it's out, it's very hard to bring it back. I remember as a child, you know, as a five, six year old, my rabbi, Rabbi Beaton, used to give the example that stayed in my head from five years old. And he said that we define Lashon Hara, negative speech, as a person who goes out to a mountain on a windy day with a feather pillow and you stab the pillow and you rip it open and all the feathers go flying. And then we're like, go and gather those feathers together. Go bring them back. It's very powerful imagery. It's not just this. I've heard this many, many times. Go bring these feathers back. It's almost impossible. Once it goes out to retrieve all the speech and the second and the third and the fourth hand is almost virtually impossible, which is maybe one of the reasons that making teshuva repentance for this particular sin is almost, almost impossible. Once the words are out there and they're hanging, and I know through arguments and fights that I've had and still have, you say it and you're like, it's going to take a long time to try to bring that back. The damage done. And the amount of people are now involved in it. Second, third, fourth hand. And by the way, we all play Chinese telephone as children. By the time we reach the third, fourth hand, it's a whole different story. But it started with 
you. It started with you. Those, my friends, are the five categories of negative speech. In the future, I will give you a list of seven ways to know whether your negative speech is actually constructive. I've ran out of time. I will, God willing, broach that topic in the future. May we all hear the words of Rabbi Kleiman of blessed memory, maybe just one second before it comes out of our mouths. How much agmat nefesh, how much stress to ourselves, to, our, to the person we're speaking to and the person being spoken about, we will save each other. Thank you all. Have a great, amazing, positive, fantastic week. And with God willing, we'll pick up the third and final part of this speech series next Wednesday. Same time, same place, same rabbi. Have a great week, my friends. Shalom.